welcome everybody. Thank you for, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Roz. I'm representing One Planet Abingdon um, this evening. Um, hopefully you've all heard of One Planet Abingdon. Um, if you're not, I'll just give you a, a little bit of information uh, about it. Um, we're supported by the town council um, and our vision is to help create a One Planet Abingdon where everyone in the town is focused on living within the earth resources. Uh, we set up a climate emergency centre, which you can find underneath the town hall. Um, we're organising lots of events there, and it's where all, all the magic happens, as they say. Um, and we're trying to connect people and organisations um, within the, the area of Abingdon. Um, but we, we spread our wings a little bit wider than Abingdon. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. His name is Richard Dudding. Uh, he was very closely involved in the Radley Lakes Master Plan from the outset and was one of the founders of the Radley Lakes Trust. Now, I'm sure Richard will tell you a lot more about Radley Lakes, um, but if you don't know, it's an area of former gravel workings close to the Thames um, between Radley and Abingdon, um, which I'm sure you all know is, is in Oxfordshire. Um, it's a now valuable green space. It's tranquil and rich in wildlife. And the Radley Lakes Trust was established to conserve and manage the lakes and their wildlife for the public benefit. And Richard will be talking about why this area is so special for people and for wildlife and the vision of the, the master plan um, and some of the projects that are already taking place to turn this vision into action. So Richard, if I pass over to you. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen. So if you can just yeah. bear with me till this nervy bit is over. Can you see that? Yes, it's not in uh, sort no, of display that's, mode that, though. That's, that's the next stage, don't worry about that. Okay. Can you still see it? Yep, that looks brilliant to yeah. me. And anyway, thank, thanks very much for asking me. Um, good to see a lot of you um, there. The bit which worries me is there are, just noticing the faces. There are some people who know considerably more than me or will have their own views on the same subject but I'll, I'll just um, live with that. So I'm just going to change my view. Um, okay. What sort of aim is to, and some of you will, will not need this, um, but to increase awareness, firstly, about the Radley Lakes area itself. Um, secondly, about the Radley Lakes Master Plan. Thirdly, about the Radley Lakes Trust. And in all of this, the underlying theme is to you know, convey you know, why it all matters um, so much, which is, I suspect, why everyone is here this evening. Just for orientation, this is a, a Google Earth map. The red line shows um, the boundary of the Radley Lakes Master Plan. I could personally prefer um, this map, so I'll just draw attention to some features um, on this. Um, you've very obviously got Abingdon here. Um, you can see the area is right next door to Abingdon, which is very significantly so, right next door to the Science Park. It's bounded on the east side um, by the railway, the main line railway, um, on the south side um, by the River um, Thames. And what's in the area, although you might say that some gravel unites most of it, what's in the area is, is very varied. Um, people tend to know um, Thrupp Lake because it's very beautiful. It's got a very nice um, um, path around it and it's a subject of a significant um, campaign. What is not known so much is what else is in the lakes area and the diversity um, of what's there. Uh, I'm hoping you can see my big yellow cursor. Um, but if you just go to the west of um, Thrupp Lake, Thrupp Lake was um, 
excavated the gravel probably around about 1950, so really quite um, early. Um, done without planning permission very early on. Um, to the left um, here, there's another bit of um, early excavation. Um, after that was completed, it was um, filled with um, municipal waste, um, organic landfill, not done very well in a very um, environmentally friendly or licensed um, way. And that is, um, that's become wild. Um, some fly tipping there, but what isn't fly tipped is actually quite, quite wild. This area to me is, is most interesting and least known. And everyone knows the campaign to um, prevent Thrupp Lake being filled with fly ash. What is less well known is the areas which were actually filled with fly ash slightly before that campaign. The planning permissions were changed after that, um, voluntarily changed to require restoration to nature conservation rather than agriculture. That process of restoration is complete, um, but it's actually quite difficult to access this area. Most people don't know it's there, don't know what's there. And if they do know what's there, they often are in total disbelief and say, you're having me on. It's not really like that, is it? It's full of fly ash, it can't be like that. Um, but actually there's amazing diversity um, of habitats enjoying the alkaline um, soil um, here. There's an area here which has yet to be extracted for gravel, probably will be, but um, permissions for that have to happen. It's the only area left um, with gravel, relatively um, small but significant. Um, on the west hand side is Barton Fields, which is in Abingdon. This little area is in Abingdon rather than Radley. Um, that is original um, grassland. Um, no, no gravel there, um, to my knowledge, um, the most stable area. As well as the very big lake of um, Th Thrupp Lake, there are small lakes of um, great beauty, um, Longmead and Orchard Lake in particular, I think. Um, it's a different kind of lake, it's shallower, um, it's very good for um, amphibious uh, wildlife because of its shallow um, slopes. There are some plantations down here, which got taken down. Everyone thought the world was coming to an end. I tried to say it's not coming to an end, that it's got disease that's going to be replanted. That replanting is now happening. But the other green areas, they include lots of kind of, and I think it's some kind of among the most interesting, lots of really kind of wild, wet um, woodland. And around about here, lots of wild, wet woodland. Here, lots of wild, wet woodland. By the edges of the, the Sustrans track here, lots of wild, wet woodland. And can people think this is um, wilderness? It must have been always like that. It just wasn't remotely always like that. What you had um, until the Second World War, is you had cloud fields um, here, you had pasture round about there, and here was, was meadow um, with no trees at all. It was grazed uh, meadow. All this rough wildness just didn't exist. The reason why the rough wildness has happened is when the gravel extraction started, um, the bits in between weren't grazed, they just um, grew wild. And so what you've got is, out of all of this is, is an amazing um, diversity of habitats. You've got some areas which are just grassland, as they always were, there and there. You've got areas of um, open water, mainly deep water, some shallower bits of water. Um, very attractive to waterfowl. You've got these very interesting alkyl soils areas here, which also have got wetlands and ground nesting um, birds. And you've got these kind of roughish areas, you know, which are great for, for newts and lurking things. What is kind of not um, brilliant um, is access and kind of orientation. You can get into the lakes area relatively well from Abingdon, um, either along Barton Lane or past the Leisure Centre. Um, if you're in North Abingdon, though, or in Radley, you're probably going to want to come down Thrupp Lane. When we did a, a survey, we actually found that most people coming from th down Thrupp Lane weren't from Radley, they were from Abingdon, from North Abingdon. That has got a major problem with lorry traffic, um, which is unsolved. We'll come on to that later. Also within the lakes area, within 
um, access is poor. There are places if you know what you're doing, you can walk even though um, it's not actually formally um, allowed. Um, but people who aren't used to that, they either don't walk because um, they are unaware of what they can do, or they're kind of panic and say, where am I? Let's um, get back to base. Orientation is absolutely dreadful. If, you, if you're around in this kind of area, you can very easily have, not have the faintest idea where you are. If you walk down here, you people are amazed to suddenly discover they've got the River Thames there. They never dreamt they had the River Thames there. The, the link with the river between the River Thames and um, access within the lakes is, is very poor. And most of the areas you can't access um, at all easily. What you can do well is you can go down the Sustrans track there and you can go around Thrupp Lake there, but existing access um, is not, not very good. Just to complete this picture before I can move on, there are two um, industrial areas here. There's Tuckwell's Yard concrete batching plant. There's another concrete batching plant here and a kind of miscellaneous industrial estate. They're on the edges of the lakes area. They don't impinge as much as they might on the area. They do, however, impinge significantly on the traffic and they, that raises major traffic issues. Here's a picture of major traffic issues, not made up, it's not difficult to get a picture like this. Two heavy gravel lorries, one going in, one out. Um, actually being quite a nuisance to each other and an even greater nuisance um, to the cyclists. The traffic on Thrupp Lane, the heavy goods, goods vehicles, is a is a real problem. And that's kind of a conflict. I think a lot of the other things about having different uses of lakes is they can coexist. The lakes area is quite big, um, but there is a conflict when it comes to traffic. You're not meant to be able to read this, but this shows um, land ownership. The point being, it's very, very um, diverse. Um, there's some big landowners, um, some small, some good, some bad, some middling, but there are an awful lot of them. So achieving things means working with landowners and it means working with a large number of landowners. And that isn't simple and it's quite different to some other areas of, of natural beauty where you have a single landowner. However, the area is absolutely amazing in its potential. It's not just potential, it's what you can see now. Um, these are just examples of scenic beauty of the green space. All of this, you have to remind yourself, pinch yourself, bang next door to um, a large town. You've got some great diversity um, of wildlife and that stems from the diversity of habitats. And um, the orchids there, for example, you know, they thrive on the alkalized soil. They thrive on the PFA, which everyone thought was bringing the world to an end. There are some orchids anyway. There are far, far more orchids now than there were before. There are ground nesting birds. There's uh, lapwings, eggs. Again, that's in the PFA-filled um, um, area. So what, what is great about the habitats and diversity um, actually is, is the product of the way the lakes have um, developed. Just some pictures of health and um, well-being. They're not, not very good pictures. That person there is running, not very impressively. That person's walking. That person's looking at birds. I like this picture here. Um, actually, if you blow up the whole picture, you get that. And the reason I like it is not because this boy is desperate to have a pee, which seems to be true. Um, it's a young mother, young family. And how they got there? They got there on bike. This is their bikes. They're really enjoying themselves in a peaceful way. And looks like the geese are about to have a, a nice bit of food as well. I think that can, for me kind of sums up uh, the image of Narad Lakes, which is such, you know, one wants to keep in one's mind as what one needs to keep and preserve and build on. They were quite young. Uh, when it comes to volunteers, often they're a little bit older, not necessarily so. These are all volunteers um, in the field. Um, and they're in an area called Thrupp Green, which a long time ago um, was a ploughed field. It was then um, extracted for gravel, then was filled with PFA. And now it's actually rather fine. As you can see, it needs a bit of management. And kind of people look at this and when you say that's that can't be there, it can't be filled with PFA, it looks beautiful. Well, it is beautiful. It's been very carefully restored and it's of a very high ecological value. Just on the institutional side, and people 
can people talk about history? Um, some people say that history started in the year 2005. Um, others say it started in the Mesolithic era when we first um, found remains of um, activity in the lakes. I think um, there's quite a lot to be said for both views. But And the key thing about 2005 is when the Save Radley Lakes campaign was um, launched in order to stop um, Thrupp Lake and its neighbour Bullfield Lake being filled with pulverised fuel ash, as had already happened in some of the other lakes. That campaign was successful. Um, 2008, the ash um, was found not needed to be put in Thrupp Lake. Um, 2010, Save Radley Lakes transmuted into Friends of Radley Lakes, into more kind of steady state, um, um, taking interest in the welfare of the lakes, less in campaigning to save it. 2018, um, the Radley Neighbourhood Plan um, was formally um, adopted. It's formally part of the development plan. In the, the process of developing that neighbourhood plan, Radley Lakes was identified really as, as important as anything else in the whole of Radley Parish. There is a lot um, in the neighbourhood plan about um, Radley Lakes. Just two things to bring out there. The first is that one of the main actions from the plan was to develop the Radley Lakes Master Plan to which I will come. The second point is that if you have a neighbourhood plan, you're able to keep 25% of community infrastructure levy. And if you have large amounts of housing in the area, new housing, you have large amounts of community infrastructure levy. Now, Radley has got a neighbourhood plan and it's got large amounts of housing. Um, there's 750 new houses, something of that order. Um, and that has um, potentially made funding available. And I'll come on to that. And the Radley Lakes, the master plan was developed 18 to 20, started by talking to absolutely everyone, you know, what they want and um, what was important. As it developed and um, got momentum, um, Parish Council agreed that the process should be overseen primarily by a charitable trust, um, the Radley Lakes Trust, set up independently as a registered um, charity. It needed that kind of um, focus and I'll come more on to that later on. The trust finished the work on the master plan. And in last year, the master plan was launched and the trust was launched. And this year, what you've increasingly got is things actually being to happen on the ground. You've got delivery on the ground. The trust um, is a registered charity. Um, every registered charity has got to have formal um, objectives. Just two things to point out about um, RLTs. Firstly, is that the objectives are entirely related to the Red Lakes area. Unlike, for instance, the Earth Trust, who manage land in Whittenham and they manage it um, elsewhere. Red Lakes Trust is entirely um, focused on the Red Lakes area. The other thing is just say that actually the objectives within the area are actually quite wise. It's just not protecting the environment, but education, science, advancing human health. Probably our activities so far isn't 100% balanced between those, but they are quite wise. And I think over time, that balance will probably increase. So what's the Trust been doing or doing? It's finishing off the master plan and launching it. Um, Community engagement, and I'll just say um, a bit um, more about that, but I think today's um, talk is just one of many examples of the way in which the Trust want to engage with the wider community and see it as essential to engage with the wider community. It's also um, essential to work, um, to work with stakeholders. I'll come again onto that um, a little bit more, but the Trust can't achieve much without working with stakeholders, taking them with them, getting them to um, share um, objectives and aspirations. Raising finance, also um, very important. Most of the um, trust's money is grant from Radley Parish Council. That grant is using community infrastructure levy. However, the Parish Council rightly um, want to see the trust getting finance from elsewhere. So there is grant finance, for instance, from 
Kai Foundation, Charitable Foundation, um, Abington Town Council, Trust for Oxford Environment, we hope, some tiddlers like the Newbury Building Society. Um, and also there is um, help in kind rather than in cash, and that in particular from RWE and Tuckwells, two of the landowners. And lastly, the trust um, responsible for governance, we're a registered charity, we've got strict ways of working to meet our charitable obligations and doing things properly. If you had a kind of bubble, um, Radley Lakes Trust, um, you'd probably say that within that bubble, there are four, four units. There's the trustees themselves who legally are the trust, and I'm a trustee, and I fear I spotted in the audience at least three other trustees who will be checking on what I'm saying. Um, there's an advisory panel. The, the trustees all have got an enthusiasm about the lakes. They've all got a willingness to spend time to make sure that they operate together as a team in governance. They don't necessarily have deep expertise about um, ecology um, or matters of that kind or land management. The advisory panel is there to bring in that expertise. Volunteers um, are the, the third level there. And think, tend to think of volunteers as being operating in the field. And I showed some examples of that. Um, it's, that's not the full story remotely. Um, and the trustees, you might say, are volunteers. But we also have lead volunteers who, are, who have developed our website, who manage our social media and manage our databases. And so those kind of, if you like, back office um, roles are done by volunteers as well and of great importance. Friends of Randy Lakes Trust are our um, members. Um, and we'd certainly hope that those of you um, who aren't members um, would want to um, become so. So that's sort of bubble, there's the Randy Lakes Trust um, bubble there. But um, if we got those relationships right within that bubble, we get absolutely nowhere um, because the success depends on the relationship between that bubble and stakeholders and community. And it depends on that operating two way. So it's why a lot of time and effort is put in into those arrows and into those arrows both working in both directions. There are 10 um, trustees um, at present. We reckon that number's um, about right. We started with six, it's gone up to 10. Once you get beyond a certain size, it's not very good for dynamics and management. It's about right in number. Balance probably isn't perfect. It owes to some extent to history. And over time, that balance, I think, might improve. It needs to be, in my view, a little bit younger and a little bit um, more female. I say this as a 71-year-old male, but um, it, it is true. If you look on the other hand at our advisory panel um, there, actually the balance there is very good. Um, balance by gender is very good. Balance um, um, by skills and expertise is very good. And all of those people, all of them bring expertise in their own area. And we don't get them together as a panel and say, what do you think, a panel? We, we ask them about particular issues. And an example I like to give is Lucy Kennery um, manages the Lur Windrush um, Valley project in West Oxfordshire, similar but larger. So we, we pick our brains and on things like who should we go to for signage? And she's brains are very so willingly um, picked. So we try and use people individually um, in that way. Stakeholders. Um, Local councils, district council, um, Vale, um, are very important. Um, we've sometimes struggled to get the right connections between their aspirations, which are 100% um, the same as the trusts, um, and getting um, that reflected in development on the ground. We've worked a lot um, with the Vale um, over the last few months, and that has, I think, been pretty well put right. We have very good relations indeed with Radley Parish Council, and also with Abington Town Council. Abington Town Council and the Parish Council have both um, endorsed, co-endorsed um, the master plan. And to very extent, um, councils have money. Um, broadly speaking, the larger the council, the less money they seem to have, but they, they've all got some money. Even the Vale have just announced today, 50,000 pound grant scheme. Landowners are absolutely crucial. 
the, the trusts have the power to hold land. Um, and over time, it might well be that we'll exercise that power. But as of today, um, we own or lease no land whatsoever. We work through other landowners and we try and reach agreements with them about access and um, about the way their land is managed. And we do that with varying success. And we're not actually too exercised by that. We can't do everything we want um, at once. So we're tending to work with the landowners first, who are most happy um, to work with us. And they do exist. They've been extremely helpful and they're very important. Um, others, I think, will fall in place um, over time. Businesses we probably don't do enough with. Um, we're right next door to the Abingdon, the Barton um, Science Park. We've talked to Sophos in particular. We could probably do more of that. We, we've done a lot to talk to other environment and leisure groups. Um, obvious ones like um, Earth Trust, um, TVIRC, um, the Ramblers, Friends of Abingdon Civic Society. And um, we've, uh, if there are any gaps there, there are gaps we immediately want to put right. We probably haven't done as much as we might yet to talk to the educational and health sectors. And I think that's an area which we need to grow over time. And the community, um, friends are our members. Um, and for, for, for forging that link with our membership um, is, to our mind, very important. We want to increase the number of friends. We run events and we participate in other people's events. We're about to um, announce the next day or two our programme for this year. It includes a number of walks. It includes um, a large set piece event by Thrupp Lake. And we're having to decide quite what we call that. Um, it will have a, a, a big event, um, set piece event with a speaker and a report in the year, uh, and one or two other things might develop. Other people's events, and I say, what do we mean by that? Well, the Abingdon Marathon is starting up again, um, October this year. It runs right the way through the Rans Radley Lakes area, and they like to have marshals. Well, they need marshals. So we've said, well, look, we'll, we'll marshal for the whole of that area, um, and we get paid for that. And that goes into our funds. It's also excellent um, PR. So that's an example of you know, riding on something which is happening anyway. Um, communication and presentations like this, but we put a lot of work into developing our website. It was launched last year and has been much expanded um, this year. In the last month or so, there's a lot of um, new material. We have a um, Twitter account. We have a... Um, Instagram, Instagram account. We are about to have a Facebook account. And that's been a, a little bit of a, a struggle. That's about to happen. But I think most of all, you know, what matters in our relationship with the community is making sure the community have access, they're aware of what's there in the lakes, and they, they enjoy um, what's in the lakes. And that's, that's the crucial thing. That's the measure of how well we've worked with the community. Coming into the master plan, um, there's kind of a vision statement at the beginning, which um, I put into three little um, bubbles here. But I've, I've underlined some words, which I think are the important things. And first is um, tranquility. There, there is no doubt that while there are some disagreements about minor things, the great majority of people who, who go to the lakes, who want to go to the lakes, might go in the future, value it for its tranquility. They, they don't want um, windsurfing, which has happened in the lakes here in the past, let alone water skiing. Um, and they want, they want quiet um, activities and they want activities which um, have a beauty about them. Access is very important for the local community and very important indeed. And I've said it's not actually very good at present. And why do people want access? Well, they want it for lots of reasons. But I, most of all, it comes down to health and well-being, and it takes lots of different forms, but that's what it comes down to um, largely. And the bubble on the right is about habitats, and that word um, diversity to me um, is a key one. The lakes area is different to many others in its diversity of habitats. It's not just a richness, it's a diversity. That's the master plan area. I don't want to repeat everything. Um, 136 hectares, you can't picture that. Well, picture Thrupp Lake and, and multiply it by 10. And I think that 
gives some idea of the scale of the area. Um, heritage is um, very rich. Um, I could talk for hours on that, but I won't. Very diverse in its habitats. As I've said, poor access and poor orientation. People often have the faintest idea where they are and how it relates to anywhere else. And it's right on this, the doorstep of this big area called um, Abingdon, um, let alone, sorry, smaller and um, more perfectly formed one called Radley up here. The master plans were grounded in consultation. We had a very big um, um, consultation event, September 2020. Um, people filled in um, forms with their ideas and views. We had some of that 98% either supporting or very strongly supporting the master plan as a whole, which is pretty good. Some of the detailed comments you know, caused us to change or, or tweak what we did, but the overall level of support is very strong indeed. And what the plan tries to do is to use this bigger size of the lakes area to use it to try and reconcile nature access and the remaining minerals. So there's a degree of segregation. Segregation. It's pragmatic and long-term. It's not a kind of short-term overnight um, revolution. It's working probably over about, there's no fixed time, but five to 10 years might not be a bad idea. It's working with grain, with stakeholders. Got quite a bit of money available. That figure there is including what we hope to get from grant income, and it's over about 10 years, so don't get too excited. But that is good project income. The one thing we're poor on um, is money just to sustain ourselves um, in our everyday work. We don't pay anyone. We have no paid staff. We rely on volunteer work. And we have very, very low overheads, but it's probably unsustainable over time. Um, we're not going to do everything at once, but we are very keen to, to build momentum and to do so through five initial projects. And those are all pretty current now. The first is what um, we call the sounding bridge path. The sounding bridge is a bridge underneath the main railway line there. And the path is in two stretches, one from Radley Village to the sounding bridge, the other from the sounding bridge to the heart of Radley Lakes. One landowner up here, um, another landowner there, both have been absolute models of joints working with us. Now people say, no one will ever agree to have permissive paths. All landowners are nasty, they're bad. Well, these actually, they've agreed to this and they've worked with us. Um, and we've now um, just erected um, some sort of signage for this path. Now, if you'll forgive a bit of self-indulgence, um, the signage has been erected over the last week um, and it's finished um, this morning. I were two big events today. This is only one of the two. The other is finishing the signage. So I just put this little montage of the, the signs as you go along the sounding bridge um, path. At either end, you've got finger posts. You've got one in the middle as well. Um, you've got two interpretation boards. These are our, our small ones. One as you start from the Radley end. One here, which is near the sounding bridge, which is a wonderful place for looking at things. You've got some um, way markers, um, you've got some um, trustees digging holes, and you've got the ground being so tough that spades got broken. That's half a spade, and that's another half of a spade. It is really, really hard work, but we had some nice weather and it's done. Next project is parking area. So forgive the word sandals. Sandals is the old building called Sandals, um, which is here. Um, there is some chaotic parking you get along the Sustrans cycle track just here. And what you want to do is um, there's chaotic car parking. There's not a single place in the Radley Lakes where you can put a bike. So what we want to do is create a small parking area here, which will also include um, 12 bikes. And the aim is, it's difficult to enforce this, but the aim is that it'll be for those who need to use their car and there will be um, priority for the disabled. The idea is certainly not to encourage more people to come by car, it's to tidy things up. We have planning permission, the line of Leylandi um, has been cut down, and this is going to be more than offset by 
um, planting of native hedgerow. And indeed, our ambitions on that seem to be growing by the day. This is a slightly out of date version of the plan, but you've got cars here, you've got bikes there. This is where the landy were. And the reason why it's being opened up in this way is a car park's tend to be used for antisocial activity. And the idea is to have it fully open um, so that, that doesn't um, happen or it's deterred. And this is where the native hedgerow will be to be double row with further plantings there and there and perhaps elsewhere. That should deliver, the work started should deliver some May, perhaps June, but certainly I hope May. Next door to the um, parking area, there'll be a, um, a hub. This is one of two access hubs into the lakes um, area. It's been entry and information point for the whole of the lakes area. So there'll be one of our large interpretation boards, and that will say a bit about um, the lakes, where to walk, what to see. There'll be some, somewhere to sit, and there'll be a memorial to save Randy Lakes campaign. That actually will be on the other side. That'll be here. At one time, we thought they might be together but um, that'll be there. But I think that this hub here over time will become more and more important. We don't want it to be intrusive, but we want to make sure it works so people can see what's in the lakes area and they can sit and enjoy it. I said that'd be one of our large interpretation boards. This is a large interpretation board, um, map of um, the area where you can walk, some brief material, um, about heritage, landscape, wildlife, access and walkings. These little QR codes here will mean you can go direct to our website and the website will have much fuller material um, on those um, subjects. There's, um, that was at the east end of the lakes. At the Barton Fields end here, there'll be another um, similar hub. Won't repeat everything, but one thing which makes it different is that um, there is a plan um, to greatly improve the path which links the NCN um, Sustrans track and the Thames path. People don't have a sense of that communication between the two at all. There is a path, but it's almost impassable um, in the winter months. So we're going to improve that and we're going to have it integrated with the hub area with a, um, a similar surface. And you know, it'll greatly help those who want shorter walks, perhaps people working here, they want to see the, the river in, in their lunch hour. And that will be of a high standard, which will be accessible um, for disabled and people as well. The lands owned by Vale District Council, managed by ABNATS, we're working very closely with both of them. Interpretation signage. I can say at the outset, I can't underestimate it, how people don't know where they are in the lakes. They also actually know remarkably little about the lakes. They know a bit about Throp Lake and they know about um, the plans to put Asher. They know amazingly little I could find about what's in the lakes area as a whole um, and some of the reasons why what's there now is there, especially the, the habitats. So there is kind of, this is where the educational side comes in a little bit. There is an educational element um, in the interpretation boards. Big ones at the hubs, smaller ones along the walks that we put up two in the last week, finger posts and the way markers. The way markers will have a little natty RLT disc on so you get some idea where you are. When I looked at this presentation, I adapted an old one. This is all in the future tense. It's now in the past tense. All of this is designed, manufactured and delivered. It's all arrived um, in a barn here, 3rd of March, and we put most of it up. So things really are happening um, on this. Um, we are very anxious also that by the time these boards um, went up with these wonderful QR codes, we would have actually done something with the website to actually put new material on the website. That's been done as well. We also have um, a leaflet version of the interpretation and signage, which you can take around with you. We haven't launched that yet. It's actually done though. We're just kind of holding back a little bit until the hubs are ready as well. So trying to convey on this is there's an awful lot happening in, in progress. We, we got beyond the, the talking and planning stage. It is um, delivering. And we hope the more that's delivered, the more that this creates a sense of what can be delivered and what, what and how that can be taken further. So I kind of want to end really by encouraging you to um, get involved if you're not already. And I know some of you are, perhaps most of you are. Visit um, our website, which is there. Follow us on social media, volunteer, 
become a friend of the trust. So becoming a friend of the trust, I should say, is dead simple and free. People tend to worry about how much it costs. So I can tell you it costs absolutely nothing. Um, we're not using friends as a way of getting subscription money. We we'll need to get money in other ways. So we're deliberately keeping it as open as possible to encourage as many people um, as we can to become directly part of the trust. And if you email that, it will come through to me and we can, uh, I can always provide more information. That's the front page um, of our, our website. It's very attractive. I think the website as a whole is very attractive. I think when it's first launched, my own view is, is very strong aesthetically and hope people didn't look too closely because one not all that strong on content. It's now been great to strengthen on content as well. Needs to be um, developed further. But if you haven't had a look at the website, um, do, do have a look. So I'm going to shut up now other than to ask questions. Um, I'm happy you ask as many as you want. Um, if there's anything afterwards which you want to ask about, um, I'm just take a note um, of that email address. If you email um, that, it will come to me. It won't go into black hole and you'll get an answer, even if that answer is um, then actually no. So that's, that's all I want to say. I've probably gone on um, much too long, but I'm, I'm very happy to answer um, as many questions or take views, comments as you'd like. Shall I stop sharing? Yes, if you could. Okay, Thank you very much. Sharing. Thank you very much, Richard. That was really interesting. Um, I, I'm, I was aware of the, the lakes, but I, I certainly didn't know as much uh, information as you provided today and, and that they were as big and spacious as, as you said. Um, so I've certainly learned something this evening and I'll, I'll be going along, I think, this weekend to, to see all your new signs and everything. Yes. Um, I've just popped, uh, just repeated your, your website address and your, your social media handles um, in the chat there. So anybody can grab those. Has anybody got any questions? Either unmute yourself or raise your virtual or, or real hand. I can manage Ma them. Martin Richards, I can yeah, see you waving. You. That was really good. Um, you talked about access to the area. Uh, I know you've opened the the sounding bridge path and I've been for a run out there and it's great to have a, a new route to explore. Of the rest of the land, what bits are we allowed into officially or unofficially? Because I know there's a lot more paths through it, particularly around yeah. Orchard Lake. If you look at the... Um website you'll find a map of where you can walk and what that map shows is where there are official rights of way and where there are agreed permissive paths mm -hmm. we know that people walk in a lot wider areas um, and probably in most of those areas there's tacit acceptance of that happening we don't think, however, that we can sign those paths um, without the landowner's agreement. And that's not going to happen all in one go. Um, no, the not. plan in the master plan is to open up three significant walking routes, one going round the ash areas, round the edge of those, which involves two major landowners, but is probably achievable for half of it without too much difficulty. Um, one um, going round um, a loop, without in, including the Thames, a bit more difficult but achievable. The third actually is just going round Strap Lake, which is is already there. But more more needs to be done on access. But it will be done bit by bit. Um, but meantime, it's difficult to say. Um, keep on walking where you walk anyway. Um, we can't say that. Um, but the fact is that a lot of people walk um, quite happily where there aren't permissive paths. Yeah, certainly, um, if you look on OpenStreetMap... That... I can hardly hear you, so I don't know if it's me or you. Sorry, it's, it, my machine gets upset occasionally yeah. because I plug different audio devices in. I shall project. Is that better? Yep. Um, 
Yeah, if you look on the OpenStreetMap website, that shows a number of extra paths, particularly around Orchard Lake and going down towards the Thames. Yeah. Like, they'd be nice ones to get opened up officially. Yeah, I think that path past or Orchard Lake um, to the Thames is the, the one beyond all else, which would be nice to get um, a permissive path for. The, the landowner sort of is one who doesn't actually disagree with us. He doesn't even talk, so but you know, we know he disagrees. It's going to be hard work. But, you know, we, we're achieving things through hard work. Um, so um, I think these things will happen, but they won't, they won't happen overnight. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Anybody else got a question? Michelle, is that you with your hand up? It is. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. That was that was really interesting and I'm so excited to see um, all these developments. Um, I think I've asked you this question before, but I think for for this mm. evening's purposes, I'm going to ask it of you again. Um, do do Radley Lakes Trust offer any guided walks um, to those who might want to learn a little bit more other than trying to guess what birds or wildlife yeah, sure. or nature that they're seeing? Yeah. And in our sort of um, program events for this year, which we will be putting out um, tomorrow or Wednesday, um, there will be four um, walks. Got this right? There'll be one guided walk around the orchid area, which will be when the orchids are at their peak, which is late May into June. There will be a fungus forage um, in the autumn. There'll be a bat walk, August, September, when they could have forage for insects in the evening. And there is a walk which is being organized by Abington Naturalists, but we are kind of um, going to co-publicize um, um, on the Saturday of the Jubilee events which I think I'm right in saying is starts at Rye Hill, goes through Barton Fields, involves pond dipping, and will take you through a lot. And David Gaincourt, who I can see sitting there, um, will be um, leading that. So that's that's four walks. I think actually there is quite a more more can be done. I think it's relevant to the access issue as well, because it's possible with these guided walks to take people legitimately into areas which are out of bounds. We can do that by agreement on, on guided walks. Thanks, Richard. That's really exciting yeah. to hear. Can, can I ask another question? Um, I heard on the grapevine that there's otters. Are they otters? Well, so I'm going to shut up on this. There might be David Gaincourt or someone wants to come in. There have been otters. I think there's no real debate about this in Throup Lake. Whether an otter has been seen recently, I actually don't know. But I think there's no debate as to whether there have been otters in the not too distant past. But does someone else know? Him? Uh, yes, otters are definitely in the Thames and they... Um, foray into the Radley Lakes area from time to time but they're mostly nocturnal so not many people see them but they certainly have been seen throughout the area and there's been tracks seen and and sprints that's sprints is the otter poo um yeah but um the chances of seeing one is quite low I'm afraid Thank you. Martha Buckley, you, you have a question you put in the chat. Would you like to unmute and ask that directly? Yeah, so um, Rich has been very helpful with sort of accessible routes and that sort of thing. I emailed a couple of weeks back, um, but I was just wondering if you're going to mark the more accessible routes sort of on yeah. your walking map so that those with wheelchairs, yeah. pushchairs, et cetera, yeah. Can yeah. know where those are. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. It's something we need to do something um, about. We have a, kind of a broad idea of what we're doing, but that broad idea is probably not enough. We want to make sure that people can 
have easy access to the two hubs and can walk a reason can go um, in a wheelchair or whatever a reasonable distance um, from that. Um, now, but we haven't um, we haven't um, specifically designated or marked routes in that way, and it's something we probably do need to do. Thank you. Any more questions, Roger Stevens? I think you've got your your hand yeah, it's, up. It's Pat this time. Yes, it, it's his wife that's got the hand up. Okay. <laughs> um, I know this has come up before, Richard, but um, I, uh, I there's a lot of people that use certainly the, the route round um, the lake, round uh, Thrup Lake, uh, to walk their dogs. Mm. Um, and this is this is um, uh, an ever uh, an ongoing problem uh, with some people who don't seem to have control of their dogs and will mm. insist on letting them off mm. the lead and into the lake. Mm. There are going to be bigger signs and regular signs around the area um, pointing out what is preferred um, or allowed when it comes to um, taking dogs. As a tale to that, can I just add, I went down there the other day with my camera uh, and there were three if not four dogs swimming in the shallows and quite a number of dogs running around. The consequence is that I couldn't see anything to photograph within short distance. Yeah, it's it's an undoubted um, significant issue and a problem. I think it's one which we debated quite a lot in developing the master plan without really finding a solution and we did no, tricky, consider whether you can have some areas designated for off lead running by dogs which mm. might actually take the pressure off other areas mm. we, we didn't on reflection think that would work especially when you looked at the the possible um, areas you can put up bigger signs but i don't think bigger signs is actually going to cure it i'm not saying one shouldn't have the right signage and the signs which we put up today on the permissive path did say keep dogs on leads it specifically said that yeah. but i don't think signage will but i think there's like a longer term educational thing um mm -hmm. and it, it's a problem um but i don't think it's a problem which will fix easily okay yeah. michelle you've got your Hand up again, I think. Yes, um, I, I was just thinking about um, hazards, um, natural hazards. Are there any natural hazards in the area, Richard? Um, reasons why um, humans or dogs um, should go into the water? Um, anything like that that you can share? You asked about hazards in the area. Hazards. Hazards. H A Z. Oh, H A Z. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there is algae in Thrup Lake, and there are notices about algae. Um, and those notices don't seem to um, deter people allowing their dogs to swim in, in the lake. But there are there are algae issues in Thrup Lake. Yeah. And that is a hazard. Sorry. Um, is that is that all year round? That that's a hazard. I think it's, sorry, some probably know more than me on this, but I think it's when the weather is warmer that the algae um, really um, develop and grow. Right. I think it's more. Okay, thank you. Amanda Hartley has put a comment in the chat saying she went for a run um, to Radley Boathouse today and stumbled across the sounding bridge path trial trail. Um, and she just wanted to say how great it was to have a, a new route and the signage was brilliant. So she just That's wanted good. to say That's good. thank you very much. That's great. And those of us who put in putting up the signs, we did actually come across people and it was really nice. We didn't hurt they wouldn't say, yeah, signs in the wrong place, just after spending <laughs> an hour digging a hole through the worst concrete imaginable. But people were very nice and very appreciative, and that was really, really good. And it's very nice to have that comment. Good. Any more questions? 
Can't see any more hands up. Joanne Wiggins. Uh, yep. Joanne, you're on mute still. There we go. Right, sorry, I couldn't find the um, mute button. Um, just to say, we walked, I, yes, Sunday, walked along the sounding bridge path. Um, and it was great having the signs because um, at least I knew it was an official path now rather than an unofficial yeah. one. And, uh, but my, my one question is that very narrow path along the railway track, is that going to be kept clear? Because it has been almost impassable at times and very yeah. overgrown. Yeah. yeah. That's a good, very fair question. It was cut back by um, the Ramblers volunteer group um, about a week or two weeks ago. And unlike us, we put up the signs in the beautiful weather. They had pouring rain, but they still cut it back. And at present, it is really quite good, um, but it will grow again. And we, we need to um, make sure that it's repeatedly cut back and have a regime um, for that. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, um, hopefully if it's better, if more people walk it, it will naturally that will be it a bit clear. Yeah. It's part of the answers, but brambles tend to win, and there are quite a lot of yeah. brambles, so it will yeah. need some work, regular cutting back as well. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions, Michelle, again? <laughs> Sorry, this is my final question, Richard. Um, now, you and I know that we've been talking a little bit, and I think Roger, Roger Thomas, I, I met Roger in the CEC last week yeah. um, when he popped in. Um, we definitely are keen on uh, collaborating more yeah. with yourselves, yeah. One Planet Abingdon. Um, and it, it would just be, I mean, looking at the amount of people we've got here tonight, it would be um, nice to know that this was a useful um event that we've collaborated on this evening. And I hope that um, Radley Legs Trust would, would consider putting on some more collaborative events like this for us, as, as we've mentioned before, you know, something around biodiversity, maybe more in depth, something specialist. Yeah, de de definitely. And I think to us, it's, it's, it's really good. And we sort of try and do things ourselves, but it actually works very well when people come to us and say, like you have done, and say, can we do things with them? And as well as this evening's talk, I think you've got David Guyancourt going to talk to you um, about lakes um, ecology. Um, we're certainly not ruling out having some kind of display um, underneath um, the museum, as you said. We're just a bit worried about um, time and um, commitment um, on that. Um, you probably won't feel particularly sad, but I'm working pretty well full time myself on this. And there, there, there are limits to what we can um, take on, but it's not a problem of, of willingness that and any event which takes us into someone else's space enables us to reach a new group. You know, we're, we're always going to want to take it for, um, to be part of that, definitely. Well, thank you so much, um, Richard. I think we'll we'll bring this to a close now, unless there are any more final questions. Um, just a big thank you again. Very interesting talk. And as Michelle said, um, we'd love to sort of collaborate and, and do more yeah. talks and presentations and, and, and events at some point in the future. Um, so just I, I did mention at, at the very beginning um, that, you know, we're one planet Abingdon. Um, and I'd just be interested to know who has actually heard of one planet Abingdon. Um, and if people have been to the climate emergency center that we run um, below the town hall, are people are uh, aware of it. Just uh, see, a f I see a few nods. Um, yeah, great, great. Um, well, we'd, we'd love to see you all there. Um, we're open um, Thursdays, Fridays and Saturdays from uh, 10 o'clock to four o'clock. Um, we have various events going on. I did put our um, website address in, in the chat. Um, so please come and have a look at our website and pop in, um, see what we've, got, what we've got going on, have a cup of tea. We do some amazing cakes. We've got some great volunteers doing great cakes. Um, so we'd love to see you there. So thank you very much, everybody.
especially Thank Richard. You. Right. Thank Thank you, everybody. everybody.